If you're trying to figure out the difference between eccentric and concentric orientation or yielding and overcoming, this will be a good video for you. Good morning, happy Monday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right, coming off a solid weekend. Had my first combatives, I'm very excited about that. I survived it, didn't get beat up too bad. So it was kind of fun. I'm looking forward to a big week this week. Um, today's Q&A is with Ryan. So I got a chance to talk to Ryan. I've known Ryan for a while. Ryan's a great coach down, down in Kentucky. So if you're ever near uh, peak fitness and sports training, I suggest you stop by and see him. It'll be, it'll be uh, worth your, your efforts. Ryan is, is kind of a superhuman when it comes to, to picking up heavy things. He's incredibly strong. Um, he only weighs about 200 pounds, but I think he's got a triple body weight deadlift or something like that. So maybe even more than that. Um, the the Q and A covers um, a lot of uh, review concepts that I think are, are still somewhat confusing for people, and I, and I understand that. Um, so we talk about eccentric concentric orientations, yielding and overcoming actions, and we start to put them into some context. So we talk about cutting, um, a little bit of power lifting, and um, some individualization of training. So again, I think this is a really really good review call for for a lot of people. Um, to help clarify some of, some of these concepts. So if you have any questions um, or you'd like to participate in a 15 minute consult, go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and I will see you guys tomorrow. We are rolling, clock has started. All Fire right. your question, young man. All right, I wanna kind of dive into some more of the nuance with the eccentric, concentric orientation um, versus the yielding and overcoming. And so I think the biggest thing is, you know, to what extent is it useful to uh, prioritize a yielding strategy over gaining some eccentric orientation? Okay. I know like, you know, with an athlete, it, it can be very dependent on what the needs of the sport are. Um, but, you know, to my way of thinking and the conversations we've had, the only way I'm, I'm going to get eccentric orientation is, is more or less to stop training. So <laughs> I want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly. I, okay. So let's distinguish between the two first and foremost, because it's very distinct. Okay. Muscle behavior is, de is determined by eccentric versus concentric orientation. So, so we're looking at a moment in time and we're looking at a, at a relative length of the muscle tissue itself. So this is the part that actually contracts based on the nervous system input. Mm -hmm. This is what determines range of motion. Yielding and overcoming is connective tissue behavior. This is a viscoelastic tissue that behaves very specifically based especially on the rate of loading. So the faster that I load a viscoelastic tissue, the more resistance it, it provides, the stiffer it behaves. The slower I load it, okay, and again, we're talking relative relative speeds here because some things look really, really fast, but from a relative standpoint, the tissues are being actually loaded at a slower rate. So if I were to make a comparison, if I jump off of a box, so I jump off, let's just say I jump off of a, of a 20 inch box mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I land, that is actually a slower rate of loading compared to a max effort back squat because the max effort back squat load is instantaneous. It is already there. Whereas as I'm coming down from the box, I have an anticipatory concentric orientation of musculature. And then as I make my initial contact, like where I barely touch my toe. So again, we have to, we have to look at this thing in really slow motion. You look at the duration of the exposure to get to the point where the maximum load is applied based on the, on the force production. There's a lot of time in there compared to an instantaneous load with, with the heavy weight. Right. So, so that distinguishes the two elements of behavior. Like I said, a lot of people get confused because we, we talk about a yielding action when we're going into and out of a cut, which looks really, really fast. And it is visually speaking, it is very, very quick, but 
as far as the rate of loading on the tissues, there is a time span where I'm moving into where I make ground contact so that the tissue has to expand or elongate. It stores energy under those circumstances. And then as I change direction and I, and I reorient, now the tissue can actually release that energy and, and it, it behaves more stiffly as, as I come out of the cup. Okay. Does that mm -hmm. help you distinguish between the two? Yes. Okay. Now, so if you have a situation where you have a great deal of concentric orientation, that's where you're going to see the greatest movement and limitations. So goal number one then is to create greater eccentric orientation to allow more motion to occur if that's the goal. Can we play off of this cutting example? Absolutely. So if I've got somebody who's just very uh, toned up, lots of training, they're going to go into this cut and they're going to maintain concentric orientation in most right. cases, it, which it, is what we want because then they can use the, the rebound of the connective tissues. Correct. If, if they can access that. Yes. If, what if there is not, um, they're so concentric that their ability to load the cuts is ineffective. Okay. So, so look at it at, at the two ends. So, so if I am, let's just say I'm concentric overcoming. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is, that is a, a muscle that is prepared, that is producing high force, right? And the connective tissues are, are stiff. So as I go into the cut, it's, I don't, I don't, yield as much. So the amount of energy storage that I use is somewhat limited, but my ability to come out of the cut is not. But the problem is, is that I never got the initial storage in the first place. So that's going to kind of slow me down coming out of the cut. Now let's take an opposing example where I have somebody that, that doesn't create the stiffness as well. So they go into the cut, they absorb this massive amount of energy and they're slow coming out of the cut because they can't turn it around and, and release that energy, right? So, mm -hmm. so there's a difference. And some of this is gonna be genetically determined. This is why some people are faster than other people is because their connective tissues are just better designed to do these really, really cool things. But we can train this. Mm -hmm. right? Just based on the way that are your loading strategies in the gym. If I'm a power lifter, you think about, um, I want the minimum amount of eccentric orientation that I need. And I need just enough yielding action to store and release energy as I make the turnarounds in my lifts. Okay. Cause you have, if you have too much, then there's a lot of distance that could be created with, with expansion or a dissipation of my, my force production, which is what I don't want. I want it to be focused so I can, so I can create the, the lift. Okay. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm loading just any exercise, is it, is it pot? Am I going to be yielding or is it possible to get some eccentric orientation? Cause there's going to be muscular activity trying to allow the minimum amount of tissue length. Correct. Well, it, again, depending on, depending on what the goal is. So again, it's like, if I'm a power lifter, how important is my deep squat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, it, it's just not that important to me. I need enough. Cause if I'm competitive, I want to get, I want to get white lights. Correct. I want I want a good lift. So I need enough to access that. Now the, the yielding action does help me because especially with the turnaround, but think about this. It's like, if I yield too much, I dissipate some of that force that I use to actually lift the weight. And again, this is why some people are better power lifters than others. One of the reasons why you have superhuman strength for a guy that weighs 200 pounds is because you yield really, really well in your skeleton, but most likely the connective tissues that are directly attached to your musculature is very, very stiff, mm. right? And, and this is what you'll see with people that, that are very, very powerful, very, very explosive and very, very strong, right? The stiffer the tissue, right? If I can, if I can get it to yield, it mm -hmm. releases more energy, right? It's just, it's look, just go into the gym and just check your rubber bands. If you take the, if you take the skinniest rubber band that you have and the fattest rubber band that you have, and now it's easier to stretch the skinnier rubber band, 
But mm-hmm. if I could stretch the fat rubber band the same distance, which one releases more energy? The fat one. Absolutely. So you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's like um, you know, it's some, some people need 400 pounds on their back to create the yielding action. Mm-hmm. And you'll see this and, and you'll see an improvement in, in someone's squat. You know, visually, the, the representation of their technique will improve under the heavier loads because it is actually helping them to create the yielding action that they need. So I want to take it to somebody who's got a little bit different needs than a power lifter, say like a pitcher. They need, they're trying to produce a ton of um, propulsion in a very short time, but they need, they need the time to yield, correct? Correct. correct. What if they've got so much, just let's just call it extensor tone that's shoving them forward. They're late on late, um, concentric all over. Um, and I pull them back with some yielding strategies. Do, do they need to recapture some level of eccentric orientation as well? Maybe. (laughs) I mean, we always have to look at these people as individuals Mm -hmm. And, and that's, and that's been a problem. Because everybody says, okay, you're, you're a right-handed pitcher. You need to be on the right-handed pitcher program, right? Mm-hmm. So they treat all pitchers the same, which is not true, unfortunately. Right. Because if I take a pitcher that's 5'10", 225 pounds, and I have a pitcher that is 6'5", 215 pounds, I got news for you. They produce the, the velocity in different ways. One needs a little bit more time. One doesn't turn as well. And the other one needs to... to Um, be able to compress very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. But he has more time. So again, we can't, we can't treat them the same way. We have to say, Oh, you do it this way and you do it this way. And then we try to provide them the access to their potential. And that's why this is hard though. So it's like, it's like you and I are having this conversation and you go, Oh, that kind of makes sense. And then you go and you look at a real human and you go, "Uh Oh, now what do I do? Right. Yeah. But the, the principles don't change. It's just a matter of getting to know someone. So somebody walks in the door. It's like, I don't know exactly what to do with them. I get an idea and then we do something and then we see what happens. And then we, based on that, we do the next thing. And then based on that, we do the next thing. People think that they can predict what's going to happen. And I would respectfully disagree. It's like, I think we need to actually train these people over time. And that's how we figure this stuff out. Yeah. So I think one of the mistakes are at least the lens I was looking at in the past, I thought I was, you know, recapturing some, some range of motion that was maybe eccentric orientation when I was doing unilateral work, but I was just getting better at yielding. Quite possibly. So again, it's like, it's like the, the, what, what you need to look at is, is you have to, to have some form of key performance indicator that you're going to measure against. You do your intervention. And then you remeasure and you say, okay, what happened under those circumstances? This is how, this is how training should be because it's incredibly complex. There are, there are things that are going on in training that we have no idea about. Mm-hmm. I, I'm convinced of this. We have no idea. We, we don't even know what, what's taking place. But we have observations that we can use to say, okay, that was a good thing, or that wasn't such a good thing. And then what we want to do over time is do a whole lot more good things and a whole lot less of the stuff that, that doesn't either seem to matter or creates a negative consequence, right? Everybody, everybody thinks that, that there's like a cookbook. You go, oh, okay, uh, um, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then good things happen. It's like, no. Like you could do that, you know, again, you put everybody on the right-handed pitcher program. That's a right-handed pitcher. It's like, okay, three or four guys are going to do really well. Three or four guys are not going to do well at all. And then everybody kind of falls in the middle, you know, and we accept, we accept favorable change for the best favorable change. And I respectfully disagree about that too. So I don't know if I created more confusion for you. Maybe I got one, one tag along question. I think you can okay. answer. Go ahead. Uh, super compressed pitcher needs to yield um, or a young athlete who's maybe um, just doesn't manage gravity well, but they also need to add muscle mass and add size to produce for better force production because they're still underpowered. Okay. How How, how are you measuring underpowered relative to what? um, You know, in the case of a pitcher, I'd say maybe their, you know, their arm strength is low or, 
Um, Again, how are you measuring? Like, what's the comparison to determine that that one they have the potential for it, and number two, um, like, like again, how do you know? I mean, versus, I mean, I understand that you can measure pitching velocity and things like that, right. and there's any number of parameters. But again, it's like, what are you using to determine this? Like, like what oh, is? So your, I would say maybe relative to peers, you know. Okay, but but again, you can't compare them to anyone but themselves. Right. So there, 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 I think lies lies a little bit of the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, because genetically speaking, we just don't know. Right. And so again, I, I would encourage you to, to look at this from a process oriented standpoint. It's like, it's like, okay, if, if you think that he needs greater force production, if you think more muscle mass is the answer, do that and then see what happens. I'm totally okay with that. Right. But you better have some form of, of indicator to follow that's going to let you know very, very quickly. Sorry. If, if we're on the wrong path, we need to make a, make a, a change very, very quickly. Right? Perfect. I think, I think, again, the experience of working with people over time is, is, is one of those elements that, that is lacking because again, people are looking for yes and no answers, black and white solutions. When the reality is, it's like, we are so gray. It's not funny. It's like, if, if, if you say, okay, this kid is underpowered, we need to add force production, go ahead and add force production. But like I said, have something that you're measuring against. So, you know, that if I accidentally take something away, that was, that was important, you know, if you take you take range of motion away from somebody that needs, you know, as much range of motion as a pitcher does, right? Did you help? You know, and there's probably times where, you know, adding force production, especially through their levels of, uh, there's differing levels of maturity, mm-hmm. where it's going to be like, like, Absolutely. We got to drive tons of force production. I want to drive, drive his ability to, to lift heavy things through the roof because I know it's going to contribute to performance, but that's not everybody. You can't put everybody on that same program because they're all at different places. Okay. Okay. That was great. Good. I, yeah. I hope it's helpful. Um, if, if, you know, if you have questions, just, just send me an email. You know how to get a hold of me. We'll do. Yeah. Or, Thanks, or post, post them up in the uh, Facebook group. Okay. Sounds good. I'll do that. All right, brother. Have a great day. Good to see you. Bye.